mosque. As, it's, as it is situated, it is facing north. This is facing north. And every mosque in South Africa, they face north. Because Mecca is to the north of South Africa. In the north, they're facing south. It's quite a queer arrangement, each facing the other. What actually happens is this, that the attention of the Muslim world converges onto one spot, Mecca, to symbolize the unity of the Muslim people, that they have a common direction of prayer, not that God is there. Because the Holy Quran, our religious book tells us, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ I'm quoting you in Arabic, the original language. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ To Allah belongs the East and the West. فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَسَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ And whichever way you turn is the presence of Allah. Meaning God Almighty is omnipresent. Whether we look up or whether we look down or whether we look sideways, He's everywhere. This only symbolizes our unity. Now facing in that direction, when the time for prayer comes, you'll be able to wait. At about half past eight, the actual prayer starts. So facing in that direction, the Imam says, and all the Muslims say, Allah Akbar, meaning Allah is the greatest. With folded arms, we read chapters and verses from the Holy Quran, celebrating the praises of God. And we go into different postures. And in every posture, we celebrate his praises. From this position here, after reading certain chapters and verses, we go into this position here, and in this position we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, which is in Arabic, which means glory to God the Great, glory to God the Great, glory to God the Great. From this position, we arise saying, Samiyallahu liman hamida, which means Allah listens to the one that praises Him. We have the assurance that our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, who is closer to us than our jugular veins. As the Holy Quran testifies, it says, Wa nahnu aqrabu ilayhi min hablil wareed, that we are indeed closer to you than your very life veins, the very essence of your being. If our Lord and Cherisher, our Creator, if He is that close, then we do not have to shout on the top of our voices, wanting, wanting a deaf God to hear, because He listens to our secret thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and with that assurance we arise. We say, Sami Allahu liman hamida, and from this position, we say, Allahu Akbar, meaning Allah is the greatest. We go into prostration, and in that position we say, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. It means glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest. The highest part of man goes down to the lowest before his maker and we praise him to the highest. This is the form of our prayer which you will witness, the congregational prayer. Now, it seems a little awkward or queer to the Western people not used to this sort of performance, you know, the whole lot you'll find going, Allahu Akbar, and everyone all gone down, you know. He says, what is this, putting the heads down, putting the bumps up, what a way to pray. <laughs> now this is the human mind, you can't help it, you can't help it, because you haven't, you haven't done it, you see. I said, you know, this is how all the prophets prayed. And when I say that, people get the shock of their lives. I said, this is how all the prophets prayed. You get the shock because you have been reading, you have been reading, but you didn't catch the message. You see, I might quote from the Old Testament, I'm quoting, it reads, and Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And I'm quoting again, and Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. When we come to the New Testament, we read that towards his last days on earth, Jesus Christ, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. And he said, wait and watch. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. What did he do? He said, wait and watch. 
And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. Am I quoting correctly? If anybody knows your Bibles, and fell on his face and prayed to God. I'm asking, how does a man fall on his face and pray? Except the way we Muslims do. Can a circus acrobat do anything better than that? No. But you see, the modern gentleman, with apologies, the modern gentleman is more worried about the creases on his trousers than humbling before God. He wants to sit tight on his backside and he's telling God what to do. And little wonder God is not listening. So he's wondering whether God is deaf or he's dead. I say he's neither deaf nor dead. See, there is a means of approach that the spiritual physicians of mankind, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus, Muhammad, they all set as an example which we should do well to follow. But of course we are better than they, aren't we? That's, that's what you, you know, what, you're going to do that? You know, falling down like that. What? But this is what God Almighty, the prophets of God, they all, they humble themselves before the Lord. Now, skeptics might tell us, skeptics, you know, our materialistic friends, they say, look, does God need that? Is he hungry for that? I says, no, he doesn't need it. But I say, you need it. We need it. Psychologists, they tell us that our bodies are more directly under our control than our minds. If you can humble the body, you can humble the mind. That's what the psychologist says. You know, for example, let me give you an example, a very crude example. I want some 50 cents from you, 10 cents, 50 cents from you. So I come to you, you know, very humbly, you know, madam. You know, I'm hungry for three days, I have eaten. <laughs> Please see if I can have 50 cents. You see, I might be putting up an act. And once you do that, you know, even genuine tears can come out of your eyes. I got I tell you, you know, if you try and you know, put your heart and soul into you know, I, I need that 50 cents from you. you know, Please, you know, my children are hungry. <laughs> and I can shed genuine tears. Not glycerin tears, what you see in films, you know. Genuine tears can come out. You know, you put your heart and soul into what you are saying, because now, <laughs> this body of yours, you can make it to do anything. And while you're doing that, the mind also falls in tune. So if you humble the body, you can humble the mind. And this is what the spiritual physicians of mankind, they did. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad. But now, <laughs> We don't want to do that. We don't want to humble ourselves. So today now the Americans are going to the Hindus to learn what they call transcendental meditation. A word two yards long. They're learning from the Hindus. And they're pay paying through the noses in the process for learning transcendental meditation. I said, you know, this is the common property, the common birthright of every Jew, every Christian, every Muslim, if they only followed in the footsteps of their own prophets. But since you have lost touch with the teachings of your own prophets, now you have to go to the Hindus and learn transcendental meditation and pay through your noses in the process. <laughs> you see, now the one before whom we humble ourselves, we call him Allah. And Muhammad is not our Allah. See, Muhammad was a man, like any other human being, born of a woman. And the Bible tells us in the book of Job, chapter 25, verse 4, it says, How then can man be justified with God? Means, how can you compare any human being with God? How can he be clean that is born of a woman? Meaning, anyone that is born of a woman means a human being. How can you equate him with God? We in Islam, we says, no, we can't equate any created being with the Creator. To us, the prophets of God, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, Muhammad, so they are all like the towering peaks of the Himalayas. Towering peaks of piety, goodness and spirituality. We look up to them with love, respect and reverence. And so worship is due to God alone. And that God Almighty, we call him Allah and Muhammad is not our Allah. We started casually, this meeting casually. We were supposed to start at 8 o'clock and some 
ladies, some children came in, and he said, right, he started chatting, and we couldn't stop, and as, <laughs> as we came along, now, it's a bit out of order, you know, the gathering, because we were supposed to gather one place, but however, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. So if there are any questions on what I have spoken so far, or anything else that you want to know, before the call to prayer, I will answer, then there will be a call to prayer. After that I'll explain to you what the man is shouting about. And then you'll watch the Muslim at prayer. And after prayer I come back to you. And then further questions, whatever you have, you, I can answer. And then we can go and have some something to eat. So in the meantime, if there are any questions, please, don't hesitate to ask. Even criticism will be welcome. You see, this old man can take it. Anything that you have, you want to throw, you may, I will be able to catch it. Yes, ma'am. I beg your pardon, ma'am. What's written upon it? Yes, ma'am. You see, I was ex trying to explain to the children that people do come to the mosque and they want to know, open night, this was the reason. Because to the Western mind, open night means you have an opportunity now to ask. Freely. In, instead, you came here in the mosque and you asked somebody, what's that there? He says, is that your business? <laughs> so, so, so what, what is the step doing there? He said, why? You have to pay rent for it? What is it? No. This open night, we deliberately had it that you may ask any question. That is the calligraphy from the Quran, a verse from the Holy Quran, our religious book, the Quran. It says, Allah is the friend of those who have faith. You have faith? He is your friend. He is your guardian. He is your protector. If you have faith. Allah He takes you out from darkness into light. God Almighty, Allah, He is your, He is the friend of those who have faith. And he takes you out from darkness into light. That's a verse from the Holy Quran. It's a reminder, constant reminder. They put it to us, this is very beautiful calligraphy. You see, it says, I suppose it is the eyes get used to that type of calligraphy. To generally, to people it might look like Chinese or what or what not. This is Arabic calligraphy. The Quran is in Arabic. And uh, this is one of the verses from the Quran. And Allah in the Quran is the proper name for God Almighty. We Muslims, we say that call God Almighty by any name. Call Him by any name, as long as that name is not contaminated. For example, if I were to tell you, you said, look, what is the name of the God that you worship? And if I said Muhammad, for example, if I said Muhammad, immediately you think of a camel driver born in Mecca, some 600 years after Jesus, right? And if you know his history, say so yes, his father's name was Abdullah, his mother's name was Amina, and he was born in Makkah, he died in Medina, he's buried there. So you have a mental picture. So as soon as you have a mental picture, it's rejected in Islam. You can't have any name which creates a mental picture. He said the name of God is Krishna, mental picture. If the name of God is Rama or Buddha, mental picture. The name of God is Christ, mental picture. So immediately in the house of Islam, any word which creates a mental picture of God Almighty is taboo. We call him Allah. And we say in the Semitic languages, in the language of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, the name for God Almighty is Allah. For example, you see in the Old Testament, in the Bible, some 6,823 times. In the original Hebrew, the expression is there. Yot ha vav ha Elohim. Yot ha vav ha Elohim. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they make it Y H W H. They change it to Jehovah Elohim. In the English translation, is Lord God, Lord God, Lord God. 6,823 times you have Lord God, Lord God. In the original Hebrew, Yot ha vav ha Elohim. Now, this Yot ha vav ha are consonants without the vowels, which now the Jehovah's Witnesses, a group among the Western people, they say it is Jehovah. 
There's a name of God Almighty is Jehovah. I'm sure you heard that before. Yes, Jehovah. So he'll ask them, I have been asking them, I said, where did you get this name from, Jehovah? This is no, it's in the Bible. So what does it say? In the original Bible, does it say Jehovah? He says, no. There is a tetragrammaton. Every Jehovah's Witness, he knows the word tetragrammaton. Any Jehovah's Witness that comes and knocks at your door, you ask him, where did you get this from? He said, no, there is a tetragrammaton. <laughs> I sympathize with you, sir. You see, I was in the University of Illinois in America. I was speaking to the professors and the students, and somehow this thing cropped up. So I'm asking, has anybody heard of a tetragrammaton? And believe me, not one professor or the student knew. <laughs> I said, shame on you. I told the professors, and the, shame on you. I said, every Jehovah's Witness, a painter, polisher, you know, sweeper, he knows, and you don't know. Amazing. So no, you see, this is as if once a man tells you tetragrammaton, you can be a doctor or a lawyer. And you don't know tetragrammaton? So now you'll have to keep quiet. You say, look, this guy knows better than me. <laughs> it sounds all right, you know, it doesn't sound like Arabic or Hebrew. Tetragrammaton. So tetragrammaton literally means the four-letter word. Tetra means four, grammaton means letters, four-letter word. So I'm asking the fellow, I said, look, why do you use a 14-letter word to describe a four-letter word? Why do you use a tetragrammaton? I counted them, there are 14 letters there. Why do you have to use a 14-letter word to describe a four-letter word? <laughs> of course, he doesn't know. You see, because if he says four-letter word, it conjures up another mental picture in our minds. You know, for which Lady Chatterley's lover was banned in South Africa for 20 years. <laughs> One four-letter word, you know, nice. Is unbanned now. But that one word, they banned it, that book for that one word for 20 years. Of course, I was on the side, on the side of the government on that, you see. But now, so he doesn't say four letter word, he said tetragrammaton. I said, all right, what is the tetragrammaton? He said, Y H W H. I said, right now, pronounce it. You can't. These are consonants. So you have to add the vowels. I said, add the vowels, as you like. So, Yep, her, her, her can be become Yahuwah, Yahuwah, Yehovah. Where did you get the J from? Where did you get the J from? You see, you have a right to add the vowels because Hebrew and. Allah is shouting, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. This is the Muslim call to prayer. Allah. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. He repeated it four times. He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. He said, I bear witness that there is no other object of worship but Allah. Again, that I bear witness that there is no other object to worship but Allah. He's the only one who deserves to be worshipped. So I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Again. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. He's not God, he's not his son. Don't make a mistake like the others have done. They made the prophets into gods, they made the heroes into gods. Don't you do that. Muhammad is only messenger. If you accept these two principles, that there is only one God and Muhammad is his messenger, what is the message? He said, come to prayer. Hayya ala salah. it again, says come to prayer. Hayya ala salah means come to prayer. Hayya ala farah. says come to success. Hayya ala farah, come to success. This is success. You remind yourselves about your duties and obligations towards your creator and towards your fellow human beings. Again. 
he says, come to prayer, come to prayer. He's winding of the call by saying, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. The final words of warning he has given said, there is no other object of worship but Allah. He's the only one who deserves to be worshipped. You can keep on worshipping your man gods, your women gods, your money gods. But remember this, that the only one who deserves to be worshipped is God Almighty, whom we are calling him Allah. Now, if you will all go and those, you can remain there. Uh, this section here, if you will, then once we are finished with the prayer, we will continue, man. Yes. Sorry for this inconvenience. If you were fortunate, if there was no obstruction on the way, you might have witnessed the fifth prayer of the day. The Muslim is obligated to pray five times a day, every day of the year. The first one is before sunrise. Like the old saying goes, early to bed and early to rise, which is the way to be healthy, happy and wise. The Muslim tries to follow that, that dictum in, before we start our daily work, offer a prayer. A reminder about our duties and obligations towards our Creator and our duties and obligations towards our fellow human beings. First time before sunrise. The second one is in the afternoon. That is around one o'clock. The third one is between the afternoon and evening, sunset. That's called the late afternoon. The fourth at sunset. And the fifth one before going to bed. Five times a day, every day of the year, the Muslim is obligated to pray. The Jews, according to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, were supposed to pray three times a day. Jesus Christ, he told his disciples, he said, pray unceasingly. 
we are trying to put that into practice. So as much as we need physical sustenance three times a day, the Muslim says, why not a quick spiritual injection five times a day? We need these reminders. The human mind is made such, you know, that we have a tendency to forget, to forget. So we have a constant reminder. Remind yourselves about your duties and obligations towards your Creator and towards your fellow human beings. So you have witnessed the fifth prayer of the day. If there are any questions regarding what you have seen or anything else, instead of me talking and talking and filling up time, I would rather that you ask questions and I answer them. Yes, ma'am. Right. You see, at the very outset, the beginning of our prayer, which really is not, a, not prayer, I will explain that later if I have a chance. We signify, we say, Allahu Akbar, when we do that, we are signifying that we are divorcing ourselves from all earthly things and we will solely contemplate on God. We leave everything out like in the old cowboy films. You remember hands up. When you put your hands up, it says, look, you give up. So in other words, we give up every earthly consideration and we will solely contemplate on God. So saying, we start reading chapters and verses from the Holy Quran, which we keep on saying, pray. I said, we pray five times a day. You remember my words, I said we pray five times a day. In actual fact, the Muslim does not pray. It's an amazing situation that if you ask, what is that man shouting about? Suppose you are in Gray Street, and when you hear the call, and you ask some Muslim around there, so what is that guy shouting about? He said, oh no, no, he's calling us to pray. What are you doing? He said, we are praying. But in actual fact, the Muslim does not pray in the strict sense of the word, pray. You see, pray in the English language means to ask, to beseech. If we have a conflict, I have with my brother, some argument, when we go to court, and I make a sworn affidavit in which I say at the end, I say, it is prayed that judgment with cause be given to me against my brother. It is prayed. I'm asking, I'm beseeching for this favor from the judge, from the magistrate, to give the verdict in my favor. It is prayed. The Hindu prays. The Christian prays. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom forever and ever. He is praying. The Muslim, in actual fact, he does not pray. What does he do? What was he doing? Actually, this is programming. But it doesn't sound so good to say, what are you doing brainwashing? <laughs> no, that's programming is brainwashing. We come to brainwash ourselves. With what? With the data material which God Almighty has given to us in this holy book, the Quran. This is our data material, which is to be put into our God-given computer. So five times a day, the Imam, he reads chapters and verses from this book, giving us instructions. He is not talking to God, he's not telling God what to do, he's telling us what we should do. So in actual fact, we are not asking. We are getting the instructions, receiving the instructions. So what is that? Brainwashing. What is that? Programming. Actual fact, that is what happened. But it doesn't sound right to tell people, say, hey, where are you going? I'm going for a brainwashing. <laughs> <laughs> so we say we're going to pray. We are praying. So what ha happens actually? See, there is a chapter, the first chapter of the Quran, with that, the Imam, the leader, might be reading, for example, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, say, He is Allah, the one and only, Allah Samad, God the Eternal, Absolute, Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad, He does not beget and is not begotten, Walam Yakun Lahu Kufuan Ahad, and there's nothing like unto Him, Allahu Akbar. Allahu liman hamida, Allahu Akbar. Now what was going on? We were not telling God what to, to say, that He must say that He is God the one and only. God is telling us that say, repeat, that God is the one and only God that there is. He is not two, He is not three, He is not a multiplicity of gods, He is the only one. Allah Samad, God the Eternal Absolute. He is not dependent upon you or on anybody. You know, He can, He's the doer of all He intends. Lam Yalid Walam Yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. 
وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفْرًا أَحَدْ And there's nothing like unto him. Anything you think or imagine is not him. It's Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. And we say in every aspect of our being, we accept. Whatever the Lord says, Amanna sadatna. We hear and we affirm. We hear and we affirm. So that is the type of programming that is going on, supposed to be going on five times a day. We are not asking God what to do. He is telling us what to do. Say, Ayyuhallazina amanu. Say, O you who believe. Ajitanibu kathira min al-dhan. Say, avoid of much of suspicion as possible. Inna ba'da dhan yithmun. Because in most cases, suspicion is a sin. وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا And do not spy upon one another. وَلَا يَخْتَبْ بَعْدُكُمْ بَعْدَ And do not backbite or slander one another. أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا So is there a single one of you who is prepared to eat the meat of his dead brother or her dead sister? Is there? That's what the Imam is asking. God is asking through the mouth of the Imam, the leader. Is there a single one of you who is prepared to eat the meat of his dead brother? That's the question. Answer. But we are told in the system that is given to us, we are not to interject the Imam. So God Almighty in the Quran, He is posing the question. Is there one of you? Because that's what you're doing. Your brother, your sister, she's not there to defend herself. He is not there to defend himself. So you're backbiting and slandering. What are you doing? You're eating your dead brother's meat. So he questions us and he gives the answer in the Quran. Nay, you will abhor it, you wouldn't like it, even cannibals don't do that. They love your meat, love my meat. But his dead brother, carrion, he wouldn't even eat his dead brother's meat. He even he won't do that. Nay, you will abhor it, you wouldn't like it to eat your dead brother's meat, your dead sister's meat. Wattakullah. So, so fear Allah, stop it. Inna Allah huwa tawwabur rahim. Even now, Allah is off forgiving, most merciful. What has happened in the past has happened. Let it go. Don't do it anymore. It's Allah huwa akbar. Allah is the greatest. We accept. Whatever has been given to us, we accept. So, this is the data material which we are getting, we are supposed to be getting programmed with. This is all this from this book. This is the book of data material. The Quran. This is the Quran. You wrote that book. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, the question is, who wrote that book? Uh, who wrote it? You see, at the back of the mind, the question really is, I think, who is the author of the book? Now, the author, we Muslims say, is God. The author of this book is God Almighty. He used a human agency, Muhammad, for delivering that material through him. And Muhammad was an illiterate man. He didn't know how to read or write. He couldn't sign his own name. So what is he to do? At first, as the first revelation came, that message, first message, they made an indelible impression on his heart and mind. Something that, you know, like written by the finger of God, like we read in the Old Testament that God Almighty gave the Ten Commandments, and by the finger of God it was written. Literally, I understand, um, what I understand is that at the direction of God, the whole thing was given word for word. So, God Almighty inspired Muhammad with these messages, and as the volume of the sacred scripture instructions grew, it became necessary to put it down into writing. So he had his devoted disciples who could read and write, so he dictated to them. And what was dictated was preserved at the time. The material available then was palm leaf fiber, shoulder blades of animals, skins. It was written on these things and kept in an archive. Eventually, all that turned out into a book, this book here, the Quran. During the 23 years of his prophetic life, whatever was given is now in this book called the Quran. This, the Muslim believes, is the last and final revelation of God. We have these terms called Old Testament, New Testament, the Bible, the Holy Bible, divided into old, everything before Jesus is old, everything after Jesus is new. We say if there is Old Testament and there is a New Testament, the Muslims say this is the last testament. This is the last testament. And um, you know, I have got some Qurans here which I want to give to each member of a household. Suppose there's a family, two or three are here, please take only one. 
So after you have, I don't want to give them to you now, because if you have them in your hands now, you won't be able to eat the samosas. You know? <laughs> because with one hand you're holding this book and we don't like it to be put down also. You see, we, we respect and revere this book. We, we'll feel you know, hurt if you put it down. So we said, now look, while you are going out, please, you can take one each. They're absolutely free. Take one each. And uh, if they run short, you got the telephone number, you just phone and say, look, my Quran I didn't get. So he says, please come over and take it from, from Durban, from our offices. Please come and take one. We'll be quite happy to give it to you. Now let me tell you something about this book. This book is an encyclopedia of 1,920 pages. You have time to read this, sir? No. <laughs> no. I don't expect anybody to wade through this encyclopedia. We are all involved in a rat race. Who's got that time these days, you know, to sit down and go through an encyclopedia? Very difficult. So what I would suggest that this book here, this is the Quran, at the back of it there is an index, a very comprehensive index. You just browse through the index. Just go through the index. Just go through, see what it, the contents of this book is. So if you come across anything that interests you, Young man, he wants to get married. So let's see what he says about marriage. Well, you are on the point of, you know, separating. You want divorce. So right, let's see what this book says about divorce. <laughs> you want to know about heaven and the H, just like in a dictionary. Whatever you want to know, just open the index at the back. What do you want to know? Jesus. For example, look, this book, what does it say about my Jesus? Natural, natural. Is this friend or foe? This man who brought this book, he says, this is from God, is he a friendly fellow or enemical? Is he an enemy now? I'm harboring an enemy in the house. What am I doing? So, let's see. If you are a Jew, open up Moses. See what it says about Moses. If you are a Christian, open up. You will know about God and the Jewish. 144 different references about God. What do you want to know about justice, about creation? What do you want to know? Jesus. And the J, you see Jesus in the index. Number one, first item, is a righteous prophet. He is a true prophet of God. Chapter 6, verse 85. Second item, his birth, described in two places. Chapter 3, verses 45 onwards. Chapter 19, verses 23 onwards. Ha, let's see now what it says. Naturally, you want to know, what does it say? Actually, open the book. Chapter 3, verse 42. You open. I read it for you in Arabic and I'll give you the translation. This is what it says. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Wa is qalatil malaika to ya Maryamu. Wa is qalatil malaika to ya Maryamu. So behold, the angel said, O oh Mary. You know Mary? The mother of Jesus. Ya Maryamu. Inna Allah has tafaki. Wa taharaki. Wa stafaki ala nisail alameen. Don't worry about the Arabic. Don't worry about the Arabic, you just read the English. Behold, the, <laughs> <laughs> Behold, the angel said, O Mary, God has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. You're reading the Quran now, not the Bible. This is the Quran talking. God Almighty has chosen Mary, the mother of Jesus, above the women of all nations. And if you read that, suppose the Arabic was not there, and you found these pages strewn around. I can, I, I can take an oath that in a thousand years you'll never guess you're reading the Quran. In a thousand years, you'll never guess you're reading the Quran. You'll think maybe this is the Roman Catholic version if you haven't seen one. Maybe this is the... <laughs> By God, this is what you'll think. That man, this is so near to your heart. It is so near to... I'm talking to the Christian now. It's so close to your heart that you can never imagine the Quran, you're reading the Quran. He says, maybe this is, as I said, the Roman Catholic version. Maybe this is the Greek Orthodox version. Maybe this is the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And on and on, but you'll never guess you're reading the Quran. You know why? Because at the back of the mind, we Muslims are anti-Christ. We are the enemies of Christ. So you expect these things to come from the Quran? Never! See? So he said, no, it can't be the Quran. It must be anything else but the Quran. But you are reading the Quran that this book of God makes us to accept Jesus Christ that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God we are made to believe that he was the Messiah 
Messiah, translated Christ. That he was born miraculously, without any male intervention, which modern, many modern day Christians don't believe today. Including the Anglican bishops. More than 50% of the Anglican bishops in England, they do not believe in the miraculous birth of Jesus. We Muslims, we believe. Without any arguments from the Christians, we accept that he was born miraculously, without any male intervention. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission, and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission, on the authority of this book. No arguments. The Muslim will never argue with you with regards to these things. So no, we believe, we believe, we believe, we believe. Yes, sir. What about Christ's resurrection as the believe? Yes. So now, the question is, what about Christ's resurrection? Meaning, death and resurrection. That he died and he was resurrected. Now, here is a point of difference. The point of real difference is the divinity. But now, this is secondary. But I have to deal with it. You ask the question. What about the resurrection? The Quran says, With regards to that point, That they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him. Walakin should be Allahum, but it was made to appear to them so. That is what they thought they had done. Wa inna lazina khtalafu fihi lafi shakkin minhum. And those who, who, who dispute therein are full of doubts. Malahum bihim in ilm, they have no certain knowledge. Illa tiba zan, they have only conjecture to follow. Wa ma kataluhu yakinan, for the surety they killed him not. But now comes the problem. The problem is, then naturally the Christians said, look, but my book says so. It's in my Bible. Am I right, sir? He said, look, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all testified that Christ was crucified and he rose again on the third day and on and on and he was taken up into heaven. So now the Muslims said, look, but my book says this. So you said, look, your book is false. Then I say, your book is false. No, there is no way. You see, that way, you know, it's like a tug of war. You know, we are going to start throwing mud at each other. No, no, we are not to do that. We said, now let us see now. What makes us to think the way we are thinking? On the first hand, we say, because God says so. But he said, look, this is not the book of God. Where did you get it? He said, well, Muhammad was inspired. He said, look, we don't accept that. So therefore, my book, the Quran tells me to ask you for your proof. The book says, anybody makes any claim, you ask him for his proof. Skul hatu burhanakum. That's what the Quran says. You produce your proof. So you produced it, the Bible, in 2,000 different languages. English, Afrikaans, Zulu, Urdu, Arabic, 2,000 different languages there, your proof. So I said, let's have a look at it. So when I read it, I'm going to just give you a sample, example. That I'm reading your book in your language. English is a foreign language to me. I'm an Indian, born in India. You see, I acquired this English from your people. I learned this language and I'm now sharing it with you, your language. So I said, now I'm reading the Bible in English. And it's giving me an idea exact opposite of what you're telling me. I'm going to present it to you, sir. He said, you see, Jesus, when he returned to that upper room, where they had the Last Supper, after his alleged crucifixion, you know the scene. In Luke chapter 24, we read that he returns to that upper room and he wishes his disciples in Hebrew, Shalom Aleikum. We Muslims say Salam Aleikum, same, meaning the same thing, peace be unto you. Frida Fayala. And when he said peace be unto you, his disciples were terrified. So I'm asking, why were they terrified? Because if you meet your long lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, the Arab and the Jew, he embraces one another, he kisses one another. <coughs> Instead of doing that, the disciples of Jesus were terrified. So I'm asking, why were they terrified? So, the learned man tells me that Luke chapter 24 verse 36, he says that they were affrighted, they were frightened because they thought he was a spirit. I'm quoting, they thought he was a spirit. So I'm asking, did he look, why did they think he's a spirit? Did he look like a spirit? And everybody says no. Then why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like a spirit? Puzzled. So I will tell you, sir, the reason. I said, you see, the disciples of Jesus, they had heard from hearsay, people talking that the master was hanged on the cross. They had heard from hearsay, people talking that he had given up the ghost. In other words, the spirit had come out, he had died. They had heard from hearsay, people talking that he's not dead and buried for three days. 
because Mark chapter 14 verse 50 he tells us that at the most critical juncture in the life of Jesus all his disciples forsook him and fled all to have al mal farlat and khaflak all forsook him and they fled so I'm asking is it true the Bible said they all forsook him and they fled that means they were not there the knowledge was from hearsay, people talking. So on hearsay knowledge, if you know about a man who is dead and buried for three days, you expect him to be stinking in his grave after three days. So when you see such a person, naturally you are terrified. You are terrified. So Jesus wants to assure them that is not what they are thinking. So he says, and I'm quoting. He says, behold my hands and my feet. Have a look at my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself, I am the same fellow man, damn fools, what are you afraid of before? What's wrong with you? Handle me and see. Handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. A spirit means any spirit would have no flesh and bones as you see me have. So if I got flesh and bones, in that case I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. In your language, what does it mean? When a chiesa ni flesh and biena, so as yellow sin that act hit me. So if I got flesh and biena, then I'm not what you are thinking. You're thinking I'm a spirit, a ghost, a resurrected. I'm not that. And they felt him. I'm reading, and believe not for joy, means they were overjoyed. Naturally, anticlimax. They thought the man was dead and buried. He's gone, but he's here. And they felt him, and they believe not for joy, and wondered what happened, man. So to assure them further, he said, have you here any meat, something to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and he acted in the very sight to prove what? There is a ghost, there is a spirit, there is a spook. What is he trying to prove? So he said, you see, sir, this is programming. We all get brainwashed. We all get brainwashed from childhood into certain beliefs and we are not reading what's there, we are reading what's already programmed in our head. We read something and we understand something else. He said, a spirit has no flesh and bone, as you see me have. So he said, look, the man is telling you, I'm not what you're thinking. You think I was resurrected from the dead? I'm not that. Because the resurrected bodies get spiritualized. Who says so? I said, Jesus. Who says so? I said, Paul. Who says so? I said, everybody. Once you are resurrected, it won't be this. It won't be this body. It's a body of another kind. It's a spiritual thing. So Jesus says, I'm not that. And this is not a resurrected body. This is the same body. And the man is ever in hiding. He never comes out into the open. So he said, now when we read all this, he said, you see, this is programming. We all get programmed. I don't say I'm not programmed. But we Muslims say, look, come reprogram us. Tell us in your language, sir, when the man says, Want a he said, me flesh and biena, so as yellow seen that I hit me. Tell me now that in your language, the Africana, that it means a spirit has flesh and bones. In English, the spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. Tell me that in your language, it also means the spirit has flesh and bones. Tell me. I'm prepared to listen to you. It's your language. He said, that's your interpretation. I said, give me yours, sir, and believe me. There isn't a Christian who can give me his interpretation on a spirit has no flesh and bones. Spirit has no flesh and bones. What interpretation you want? This is basic, simple English. But of course, see, it goes against our grain. From childhood you believe that Christ died for your sins and now I said, look, the man is telling you it's not what you're thinking. <laughs> I know it's a shock. But now, we must be big enough to say, now let's see now, what makes you to think the way you are thinking and the talk that we are talking. Let us see if we can find some common grounds on which, you know, we can progress further. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma the question was, <laughs> when do the women come to pray? See, the obligation to pray as well as every other religious obligation which is incumbent upon the man is also incumbent upon the woman. But there is what is called a segregation of the sexes in Islam. Men and women are not allowed to freely intermingle. So in the absence of a separate facility, they pray at home. There are certain mosques which have certain separate facilities. Like this particular one here, unfortunately, you know, the way from the very beginning it was built, it didn't have that facility. But now, the free intermingling is that which is not allowed. Otherwise, everything the man does, the woman must do. Fasting, prayer, 
going on a pilgrimage, giving charity, whatever the man does, the woman must do the same. But now, you might not have had the chance of coming through that section there where we make ablution. So you might have come in straight in here. But other side, you saw the cats there, seats there, going out time, you can have a look. So the men and the women must go through the same process. And imagine you must sit there, you making your ablution there. And I'm waiting for my turn. Because at prayer time, there's always a queue behind every time. Because there's certain fixed times and everybody tries to make it, you know, as short as possible, how to get it quickly to fit into the time slot. So you making your ablution and I'm waiting for my turn. For example, and I can assure you, madam, that <laughs> as old as I am, <laughs> I see the lady, you know, sitting there, her dresses around, you know, the nape of the neck, lifting up her legs, washing her feet. I said, you know, number one, you won't feel comfortable. With a man sitting on your right hand side and a man sitting on your left hand side, and some places a man sitting across there, you're lifting up your legs and washing your feet, you might be wearing a hot pant, you know, you won't, you won't be at ease. <laughs> then, there's a man sitting on your right hand, the man sitting on your left hand side, and there's a guy waiting from behind, you know, he's watching, say, lovely tresses this lady has got, what lovely arms she's got. This is man, any man. <laughs> Unless he's a lunatic, or something else is wrong with him. <laughs> Look, this is how God made man. Then you might have witnessed as in prayer, everybody standing shoulder to shoulder. Because the Holy Prophet Muhammad, he said, that when you stand up for prayer, you must not leave gaps for the devil to get in between you and your brother. Now the devil that he was talking about was not the guy we see in the art gallery, museum complex, you know, city hall. You go upstairs, second floor there, and you see the paintings by great artists. There is one huge painting there of a beautiful woman, well proportioned with wings. She's got a wand in her hand. She's directing the devil to go to hell, and you can see the devil flying off. In the picture, you can show all that. Hellfire in the distance, and the devil is flying off. And this devil has got ruddy complexion, red, red, red. He's got horns, he's got sharp ears, he's got a tail with a barbed hook. <laughs> it's worth seeing. Some great artist has done that job. I said, now you know, a devil like that, if you saw it, you run for dear life. <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> Muhammad wasn't talking about that. He was talking about you, yourself, we, ourselves. He says, you see, I'm white, he's black. I'm rich, he's poor. That devil must not be allowed to come in between you and your brother. So he said, shoulder to shoulder. My brother can't get away from me and I can't get away from him. But instead of my brother, you, my sister, standing next to me. And I said, Allah Akbar. So Allah is the greatest. But nice, cushy feeling. Nice and warm. <laughs> I'm wondering whether she's not the greatest. <laughs> no, this is the human mind, how it works. Then we stand rows and rows behind each other, as you have seen, rows and rows behind. And my sister, she's standing in front of me there in the row, and I'm behind her. I say, Allahu Akbar. I say, Allah is the greatest. This is 36, 24, 36. <laughs> This is man, any man, unless he's a lunatic or there's something else wrong with him. <laughs> this is how God made man. You know, the thing that allures him most on this earthly existence is woman. And I don't have to prove it to the Westerner. To you people, I don't have to prove it. You know it, this weakness of man, and your people are using it to the limit. Look, Lucian Motors. Smith Street Durban. They sell, they sell second in trucks. But on the trucks that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the truck. <laughs> then G North, they move from Field Street to North Dean. G North, they sell second hand truck, uh, 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 tractors. They sell tractors. And on the tractor that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the tractor. I'm asking, what has a woman in the bikini got to do with a second hand truck or with a tractor? <laughs> Except the man. You see, he'll be enticed to read that advert because of that woman. And then BMW has beaten the lot. <laughs> BMW. Is a motor car supposed to be a little better than the Mercedes Benz? I'm not in the market for it. I had four Beatles, you know I spoke about Beatles. Four Beatles motor cars one after another. And then they did away with the Beatles, I, had, I was forced to buy a Golf. I'm still not in the market for a BMW. But a BMW Edward in our daily news attracted me. What's the Edward? BMW, illustration of a beautiful BMW motor car. In front of the motor car, there's a woman in the skimpiest bikini, what you call the tanga, the G-string. <laughs> and she's standing in a lustful, enticing pose. <laughs> and at the bottom is written, test drive her now. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, 
Oh, the woman of the car. She's buying the car. No, the buyer car. So what are you doing to your women folk? You see the Westerner, he sells his mother, he sells his wife, he sells his daughter, he sells his sister. Everything is for sale. To him, anything, his wife is a star. You know, he's proud, his wife is a star. She's being, you know, bruised on the screen. The guy is simulating sex with her on the screen and he can enjoy saying, my wife is a star. So what has happened to you? You have sense of values. Your mother is a star. Your daughter is a star. This is the Holy Prophet Muhammad, he said that women, they are your mothers and your sisters and your daughters and your aunts. They are to be loved, respected, cherished and protected. They are not for sale. So, according to our system, this free intermingling is a thing that is not allowed. But if there is a separate facility, like in the Grey Street Mosque now in Durban, they have a separate facility, separate entrance, separate place for ablution, everything is separate. They are in the mosque and yet out of the mosque, allowed. Only the free intermingling is not permitted now. But the obligation is on the man as well as the woman to pray. Yes, ma'am? Um, how is your imam chosen? Uh, how is the imam chosen? You see, we look for a person who has better education about religion than us. So we catch such a person and say, look, man, I think you know you are the best man to do the job. And we will look after your livelihood. We will pay you so much a month, you know, salary. You hold the post. Otherwise, there is no priesthood in Islam. Anybody and everybody should be capable of doing it. For example, now, at prayer time, when the call goes up, we look around and people say, come on, you young man, I want to give you the preference. He says, <laughs> not me. He's shy. So he says, now, what about you, uncle? I am also, I have some my reasons. Everybody, there's a tug of war. This is human nature. We don't want to take the lead. So five times a day, we're going to have a performance in the mosque. When the time goes to, to lead, we say, what about you? He said, what? He said, instead of that, he said, look, man, we look after your livelihood, see to it that you hold the post. So from that point of view, we appoint a person, and we pay him a salary, but there is no priesthood. In his absence, anybody can take his place. Anybody can perform marriage ceremonies, funeral services, leaving the person, anything every Muslim should be capable of doing. But for the purpose of convenience, we have a man appointed, and we pay him a salary. Yes, and he has extra little, you know, all the little details, you know, that you might do some little mistake now, how to rectify that, all these things he will know more than the general public. And at what age do you choose him? Well, generally, you see, a person has passed his puberty. It must be a male who's passed his puberty now. That's the age of recognition that he is now fit to do a, a, to lead people. Does he call you to prayer? According to? Does he call you to prayer? No. That anybody else? No, no. Uh, he only leads, the Imam, he leads. The one who calls the people to pray is called a Mu'azzin. Mu'azzin is the one who gives the Azan. Azan means a call. Anybody also can do that. Anybody. But uh, that also we appoint a man. He said, look, you see too that you hold the post. In case somebody doesn't turn up and nobody is there, nobody gives the call. So we said, look, you, this is your duty and you, do the, the job of the Imam. Yes. Do you have your own committee? burial committee? Yes. No, you see, the Muslim is an amazing community. It's an amazing community, man. We have no, uh, what's it called, burial insurance. You know, when if I die or any Muslim, no Muslim is worried that when he dies, what's going to happen? No Muslim is worried. <laughs> amazing community this is. No Muslim ever worries about death, that if I die, what's going to happen? The community, it is the duty of the community to bury me. <laughs> so in other words, if the community doesn't do that, everybody is guilty. In Islam, if some people don't do the job, everybody is guilty. So there's always some people to look after me if I'm dead. And so it carries on, man. There is no such thing as a body or a society to do that. The whole Somebody dies nearest to me, right, and everybody flocks there and we'll never ask the widow. He says, you know, did he leave any money behind? Has he got any money for funeral expenses? Nothing. That's the part of the living, to bury the dead. That's their job. They must bury it. And if they said, look, my husband has left this money, you know, for this purpose, well and good. If not, it's on the, it's on the community. The community does it. No, no. There is no female equivalent to the imam. No, among themselves, among themselves they can. Anybody can lead. Well, and the Muslims as well, anybody can lead. So there is no equivalent to that. Yes, ma'am. You said earlier that the Muslim doesn't believe in a reincarnation. What do they believe happens after death? 
Yes. Uh, the Muslim does not believe in reincarnation. What we believe in is the same as the Christians. We believe that this life is the only life that's given to you. You must make the best of it here and now. Come right with God now. If you miss the opportunity, you will have re eternal regrets. So we do not believe in reincarnation. This is a Hindu idea. And this is also out of policy they invented this idea to exploit the people of India. You see, my ancestors, my ancestors, you see, I'm an Indian by birth, but my ancestors came from outside India 5,000 years ago. We invaded India, my, my people. You see, the lightest skinned people from the north, we invaded the country and we conquered the country 5,000 years ago. Like 300 years ago, the white men came and conquered here. Maybe in 5,000 years, you might not be able to recognize the white from the colored. Might be all shh, shh. Same thing happened in India. You know, intermarriage with the Indian people and the climate and the diet changed our complexions in 5,000 years. But now, my ancestors, when they conquered India, they were a highly civilized people, cultured people. 5,000 years ago, they made gold jewelry as modern as today's jewelry. I go to excavation works in Pakistan at a place called Taxila. Around there, at the excavation works, there is a museum. And I went and saw there jewelry as modern as today's jewelry made by my ancestors 5,000 years ago. 3,000 years before Jesus was born. They had a waterborne sewerage. Waterborne sewerage in that part of the world. They made muslin cloth, a yard muslin cloth, you can hold it in the palm of your hand. So when they conquered the land, they were only about 10,000 men, women and children. They came with the sword and the spears. And the people of the land were very docile. So they conquered the nation, but they realized that sooner or later these people, even the worm turns, you know, the, even the worm turns. So as soon as they realize that these people are not more numerous than us, they are not physically stronger than us, what is making them to rule? So the sword and the spear. So we'll also get the sword, we'll also get the spear. So they said, no, these people will overcome us. Superiority of numbers by the millions compared to us. So they said, look, we will brainwash these people into a religious belief. So they, we, my ancestors found them worshipping a god called Shiva. Siva, Siva. So my ancestors, the philosopher, says, you see, we also worship the same god, but we call him Shiva. What's the difference? No, you say Siva, we say Shiva, same god. But you see, this god, when he wanted to create man, he took the form of Brahma. Brahma, the creator. As the creator, from his head, he created the Brahmins, the priestly caste. From his arms, he created the Rajputs, the warrior caste. From his stomach, he created the merchants and the farmers. And from his feet, he created the untouchables, you, teeming millions of India. So as such, you must become the hewers of wood and the drawers of water. You do that job. Well, in the next life, you've got a chance of becoming a farmer or a merchant. If you're a good farmer and a good merchant, in the next life, you become a Rajput, the warrior caste, the rulers. And if you are a good ruler, then in the next life you become a Brahman. Once you become a Brahman, you don't have to be reborn. You merge. When you die after that, you merge with the infinite. You become one with God and you rule the universe. It worked. Beautiful. It worked. You see, things so nice, seems so reasonable. You know that, look, you got a chance. You got a hope. You just do be a, you are a good sweeper, be a good sweeper. You are a sweeper, you, what do you do? Bury dead animals, you do that job well. You carry those buckets, <laughs> says, you do that job well, you know, there's a hope for you. So this is the stop they gave the millions of people in India and said, now you will be reincarnated. You'll come back again. If you haven't made the grade, you come again and you come again and you come again until you reach perfection. This is the theory, man, in a nutshell. We said, no, this theory sounds so beautiful, but it is not true. Because it sounds so nice, you know, sounds logical. But at times, logical things are very illogical. So we do not accept the theory of reincarnation. We say this life, like the Jew and the Christian and the Muslim, we are one. On this, that this life is the only life you have. You must come right with God here and now. Otherwise, you will have to pay the consequences. Yes? Uh, you agree that there is male domination in the Muslim tradition. How do you accept? of Pakistan, Muslim country. The bulk of the people who voted her in, Mrs. Bhutto, who voted them in, who voted her in? Men! Look, men voted for her. Hardly any women. The women in Pakistan, how many that had got the vote? So who voted her in? 
So you say myth domination. The other ones, they said, no, let's give her a break. So they said, let her have a break. Give her a chance. Males, generally males. Mrs. Thatcher, who voted in? Is men, generally the male. How many women voters are against male voters in Britain? Same. So in other words, there is some, some sort of fair play injustice is still there. Women liberation? Well, I don't know how to use, apply this term, but uh, there is. You can see that, you know, the people have accepted <coughs> fate accompli that she won, hands down. She beat, she beat all the learned men. So, it's a take off your hat. I said, look, she won, give her a break. Yes, sir. The great religions of the world. Yes. But, well, let's just concentrate on the Christian and Islamic uh, Based all the history, the past teachings on prophets. Right. Okay? Yes. And it can be looked upon the prophets are people from a particular time. Right. Interpreting the word of their God, or their right. God or right. Their, right. Uh, to the people for that time. Right. Okay. But if you look at these religions, they've had no prophets for over a thousand years. How many prophets? Fifth century? 1400. 1400. 1400. Yes. Okay. How can you interpret that? <coughs> you see, the Quran is the only religious book which says, and there never was a people without a warner having been sent amongst them. And to every nation a guide, a prophet was sent, God Almighty says. The Africans, did they have a prophet? And look at them, their beliefs. Even before the white men came, they had a concept of God, which was the purest and noblest. But God Almighty is a pure and holy spirit. He doesn't beget and is not begotten. And there's nothing like him. They made no images of God Almighty. South of the Zambezi, not a single African tribe with idols of images. That's a proof. They knew that adultery was evil, stealing was evil, killing was evil. They knew all these things before the white man touched the shores. But they can't name the prophets because they didn't have a written language. They didn't have a book, but they had the teachings. So we believe that God has sent his messengers to every nation on earth. And among them, there is a definite relationship between the teaching of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. They are very close. Coming from Father Abraham, through Abraham, one of his sons, the Jews and most of the prophets that we name are Jewish prophets. And then from the other son, Ismail, Muhammad was born. So we say still, it is going back to the same family tree, Abraham. And as such in the teachings also, there is a common denominator between the teachings of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, the Muslim says there is in the fundamentals there is not an iota of difference, not one God. That's fine. What about um, development of this concept with time? What if you look in the history and in the past, they are developing the concept of a deity? Why should it suddenly stop? Yes. At yes. A period. Yes. Why haven't we had more prophets right. since then? Very, very good question. You see, when a thing reaches perfection, look, mankind, our scientists are telling us that we have evolved from some primitive states, from monkeys and uh, from the amoeba and what and what not, you know. Now we have become perfect man. And evolution was taking place, they say, for thousands of years, millions of years. And now we have reached the stage. We said now we are created in the image of God a masterpiece but why has it stopped let's say you know let's stand to reason that we say now look at this hand can you imagine improving on this add another finger add another thumb add ten fingers you think you can do a better job will you be able to do a better job than this no so he said now once it reaches perfection anything you add to it is an abnormality so in the religious history of man the Muslim said that this is the last and final revelation of God. Jesus Christ, he told his people before he parted, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. You haven't got that capacity. Like for example, instead of you, my grown-up brothers and sisters, only your little children had come, what would I do? Entertain them. You know, Father Christmas, Santa Claus, and what, some funny, funny things. I have to say some funny stories to make them happy. What else can I do? 
I could not have spoken what I'm speaking to you now. So Jesus is telling his disciples, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He will... Man hasn't finished evolving yet. Right. If you, if you look at the, our athletes, they're running faster, they're right. jumping higher, right. throwing further. Right. Right. Okay? Man's mind is still developing. It's right. Evolving. Right. Now for that, for that you need guidance. You need her. Look, our friend, the champion, the sprinter, he broke all records, right? And his ethics, his ethics, where were they? Ruined, huh? taking pills, taking drugs. So in other words, look, with all your physical developments, without that guidance about right and wrong, you are still an animal. You can become faster, stronger, all that, but your behavior pattern is that of an animal. Why haven't we had an update? Well, the update now, if you find something that you need now, for example, what is your problem? Where you need a solution? Jesus said he'll guide you into all truth. And we say now all the answers to all your problems are here. It might not go down well. You see, we are used to certain way of life, certain behavior patterns, thinking patterns, and we don't like to be disturbed. All of us, we are like that. But now come with a genuine problem and say, look, there is a problem for which we need a solution. What does Islam say to this? If there is no solution, then we say, look, we'll have to look for another prophet. If there isn't, then we'll have to make one. <laughs> See? But now come with the problem. What is your problem? And I tell you now, look, problems in South Africa. We have a problem of alcoholism. We have a problem of race. The biggest problem in this country is race. Answers, answers to them. You have a problem of surplus women. There are 7.8 million women in America who can't get husbands. You know that? Problems. No. The Quran gives the answer. I said it might not go down well. You know, because you are used to a certain way of life. Alcoholism. Answer to alcohol. Answer to gambling. Ask. Everything is there. In the last and final testament of God. It's not there, then we'll have to look for another prophet. And if there isn't, we'll have to create one. We see that the prophets of the past have updated what we've had before, what we've before. How do we know that is? The claim, the claim is there that this is the last and final revelation. No, no, right now you put it to the test. You see, once a person makes a claim, I say I'm the strongest man in the world. He said, yes. He said, look, here's a 200 pound barbell, can you lift it? I said, no. So he said, that's a test, finish. He said, look, what you, you're the strongest man in the world and you can't carry 200 pound weight. So put it to the test. And the book is challenging. He said, come on, put it to the test. The teachings. I'm not talking about the Muslims. Oh, I'm a paragon of virtue, you know, and I'm an angel. No, no, nobody's saying that. But I said, the solution to your problems are all given to you and this is given by God. It's your property. They were saying, now you open it and let God Almighty talk to you. This book, when you open it, you see God is talking to you. This is not the story book about Muhammad. This book is not the story book of Muhammad. Can you imagine this vast volume here? In this vast volume, the name of Muhammad's father is not here. His mother's name is not here. When he was born is not here. Where he died is not here. Can you imagine a book like that? A man writes a book and he is not there in the book. His name, Muhammad, the name Muhammad occurred in this vast volume five times. The name Jesus, 25 times. So, it makes you to think. Why 25 times? I said, look, this man's so many controversies were around him. There was no controversy about the birth of Muhammad. He had a father, he had a mother. You don't have to, God doesn't have to go and tell you, say, look, you know, he says, he was legitimate. What for? The whole world accepted that he's the legitimate child of Abdullah. Finish. But Jesus, there were controversies. Some said, look, he's got no father. Some say, if that's the case, that he's the illegitimate child of Mary. Where does the Muslim stand? So the book comes along and answers. It tells us, Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, La taghlu fi dinikum. Say, do not go to extremes in your religion. You Jews and Christians, don't go to extremes in your religion. Wala taqulu ala Allah illa al haq and don't say anything about God except the truth. Innam al Masih, most certainly the Messiah. You know who we are talking about? Jesus. Innam al Masih, who is Abnu Maryama, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah, is a messenger of Allah. 
wa kalimatuhu and a word proceeding from him alqaha ila maryam wa ruhum minhum we see bestowed upon mary and a spirit proceeding from him ma aminu billahi wa rusulihi so believe in allah and his messenger that's what jesus said this is life eternal that they should know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent that is what the book is telling you so look this man jesus was born miraculously he is not the illegitimate child of mary and he is not god he is not his begotten son but he is a messenger of god as such love him respect him revere him follow him but don't worship him this is what the book says so now when you read it it says look this thing seems to be something objective it's not something you know a man is just trying to score points yes You see the Imam, the leader, during the five times a day, he is facing the same direction as the congregation. He is not talking to the congregation. He is talking say to say to God in that direction. So now on Fridays, only on Fridays, in the mid-afternoon prayer, the Imam, the leader, he goes on top of the steps to give him the vantage point to which to speak to the congregation and he delivers a sermon. He serves the purpose of standing for the one far more easily and better eye contact. There is no, no mysticism, no symbolism. Everything has a practical purpose in the house of Islam. No mysticism, no symbolism. Yes, ma'am. Why do Muslims wear the hat? Uh, the question is why do the Muslims wear the hat? You see, if it, <laughs> I might ask you, ma'am. I said, you see, your dad or your husband, when he goes to church, he takes off his hat. Does he? Yes. So I'm asking why? Why does the gentleman take off the hat? So the man tells me, he says, to show respect. But I said, you're telling your wife to put it on? He said, yes. I said, what for? He says, to show respect. I said, how can you be doing opposite things to show respect? So that you might have been reading Shakespeare. So he said, you see, Shakespeare said, nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I said, exactly. You see, in the mind of we people from the East, this is a sign of humility. <laughs> this is arrogance. To you, this is arrogance and this is humility. For example, an African needs a job and you need an amphan, you know, somebody to do a garden for you. So he comes along with a hat on or a cap. Sasakbona, missus. Sasakbona. He says, from Sabenzu, you'll never give him a job. This is this arrogant lout, you know, you know. Look at him. You know, he says, seven misses. He's got a chance. He's got a chance. No, it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. It's, it's nothing religious. This is all in the mind. You know, to us, this is a way of showing humility. To you, this is showing humility. <laughs> shoes. Uh, shoes, you see, ma'am, we say we are doing this in respect of the commandment given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses. When he was on Mount Sinai, God spoke to him and he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. In Afrikaans, and he said, Muni nader komni, trek your schooner, fan your futa af. When the plek where you upstand is heli khakhon. So now in respect of that commandment, we take off our shoes. But now there are certain practical reasons also. For example, in our prayer you notice that, you know, we go eventually with our faces down into the dust, praising the Lord, but you have been walking around with your shoes all over, you know, cow dung, horse manure, <laughs> we, we, can, we can bring in, and now, you know, we expect somebody else to put his face into it. So there are certain practical reasons also, but in respect of the commandment given by God to Moses, we take off the shoes. But it also serves all this clean, you know, where we put our faces, it's a clean place. No, um, some of us, we wear all the time, like myself, I wear all the time. But uh, today, according to mod modern practice, generally the people, you know, they keep it in the pockets, and when they come to the mosque, they put it on. <laughs> but um, those who do, they put it on all the time. <coughs> yes, sir. You could, um, do Muslims believe that Jesus was a very holy man, that he was spiritual, and close to God, and that he actually worked miracles in the name of God the Father? Do you believe that? We believe that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. What do you believe of the, the fact that he's actually claimed to be God? Doesn't that make him an out-and-out out liar? If he, if he did claim to be God, 
that would be something. But what we you see, but what we Muslims say, what we Muslims say, that there is not a single and equivocal statement in any version of the Bible where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. If you have such information, anytime you bring it and show it to me in any version of the Bible, say, look, Jesus says, I'm God, or he says, worship me, I said, I'll join your church straight away. And I'll worship him as God, and you know, I'll accept him as God. Well, many places in the Bible it says that Jesus is referred to as the Word of God. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right. Jesus existed right from the beginning of time. As no, I, God, I, I God think you didn't son. hear my, my, my statement. I said, where Jesus says, see the man must make the claim. The man himself. You say, you know, you go away and you say, you know, I met the Pope of the Muslims, and you know, he was talking to us, and I asked him a question, and I stumped him. <laughs> I said, look, please, excuse me, did somebody can ask you, he said, did the man say he was the Pope? He says, no. What did he claim? He said, I don't know. I said, look, don't put anything upon the man which he didn't claim. He said, now, what did Jesus say? He says, he says, my father is greater than I. My father is greater than all. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me said, of that day, no, no man, no, not the angels, nor the sun, but the Father in heaven. In my knowledge, I'm not like God. In my power, I'm not like God. He said, all power is given unto me, is not mine. Look, this is what the man of God is saying, and we accept. Where does he say, I'm God? Where does he say, worship me? He doesn't. On the contrary, he's humbling himself. I am speaking whatever is given to me, that I speak. See, the word you hear are not mine. But the Father that sent me, He had given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Even as the Father has said unto me, so I speak. Where does He say, I am God? Where does He say, worship me? I am prepared to... You know, these are interpretations. We give something, He said, I am a Father, I want. He said, He that has seen, has seen the Father. I said, you see now, I said, look, if you want an explanation, I'll explain to you what I see. But that doesn't mean he says, I'm God. I said, he must say, I'm God, because if my salvation depends on that, he must make a clear-cut statement, I'm God, worship me. And if he is God, and if he said that, if I don't worship him, I'll be lost. I'll go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. But the man never made any such claims. Yes, ma'am. When um, do all your children have to learn Arabic? And if so, when do they learn it? Uh, from very small. All the children have to learn Almost every Muslim in the world knows some portion of Arabic. Because in our prayer, we can't do our prayer without Arabic. So every Muslim in the world, whether in China, or whether in Indonesia, Turkey, wherever they are, they must know some portion of Arabic to fit themselves into the congregational prayer. Is it at school? At school. Our own, school? Our own religious school. Uh -huh. But we start at home, while they're small, you know. Instead of teaching them Baba, Black Sheep, Ring a Ring a Rosy, we start teaching them, you know, the word of God. We start from small. Yes, sir. I noticed there's a, a recess or a niche down there. Next yes. Week. What is the purpose? That niche there, you see, my ancestors, my forefathers, a thousand years ago they invented that for the purpose of acoustics. Because the Imam now is not talking to the congregation. He's facing in that direction. Everybody is facing the same direction. So, Allahu Akbar the voice is thrown back. But today we have the bike system, you know, we don't need that, but it has a, become a part of our architecture. You can't imagine a mosque today without that, because for a thousand years it has been there, and sometimes the mic might fail, so it still serves the purpose. I think, for your benefit, this will be the last question, so we can enjoy something to eat as well. I, by God, I tell you, I love to talk. <laughs> You see now we have certain fixed time of prayer. So we come sometimes before time and we want to offer some optional prayer. So you want to know whether you have time enough for that. Because while you are in the midst of it and the call goes and you are neither here nor there. So this is to make it easy for the person to say, look, mm -hmm, yeah, I still have five minutes and I can perform so many movements of prayer during that period of time. So just to assist the person from, in case he hasn't got one on his wrist. <laughs> Uh, yes, this will be the last minute. <laughs>
for, for your benefit because I think the samosas and all will be getting cold <laughs> and while we are eating there we can also you can ask questions. Right. Yes ma'am. Will you discuss the concept of Islamic marriage and divorce and adultery and the old and the new testament? Yes ma'am. It's not a big order ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> In Islam marriage is very simple. A man and a woman agreeing to get married in front of two witnesses, it's over. But now for the purpose of society, we want the people to know a young man, suppose he's done that, and I see him walking along with somebody's daughter, so thought goes say, hey, look, where are these young people going? You know, they're up to mischief. So for that reason, we try and make it as, you know, make a big noise in the mosque, so look, so-and-so, uh, son is going to marry so-and-so's daughter, and on a Saturday evening, let everybody come along and witness it for that purpose. But the requirements are a man and a woman agreeing to marry in front of two witnesses, it's all over. Divorce also in Islam is allowed. See, in the, in the, in the time of Jesus, see, Jesus took away the privilege. But the Jews had a law of divorce before, before Jesus. They had. In the, before Moses, they had a law of divorce. And their law was if a man got angry with his wife, he could tell her, I divorce you and go. And they were doing that. You see, the Jews did that. They got rid of the woman. And then afterwards, the man changes his mind. You know, he says, man, this woman used to work like a donkey, you know, free of charge. Let me bring her back. So he goes back to the father-in-law's house, tells his ex-wife, he says, come on, back home. He says, what for? He says, what do you mean, what for? So look, you divorced me. He says, no, I sent you for a little holiday, and now you <laughs> come, come, catches her by the hair and brings her back. <laughs> so Moses, seeing that abuse, he evolved the law. The law, God evolved it through him. He said, whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorce. Means put it down into writing. So you can't go back on your words. Beautiful. He said, this is now, you know, the law is getting tighter. You want to divorce a woman? Give it in writing. Now my Jewish cousins, they're my cousins, you see. Very ingenious. They were then, still now, very ingenious people. So they found a way out. They found a way out. You see, they married a woman, she got half a dozen children, and she's not the same anymore, you know, nice and crisp. He wants something nice. He wants to get something young now. So what does he do? This is a liability. So he writes out a bill. He said, darling, go. Look, he's within the law. The law says, give her a bill of divorcement. So he said, look, I give her a bill of divorcement. Then he gets another one. He gets her into difficulties to get rid of her. Very easy. What? Give her a bill of divorce. Give it in writing. He gives. Now Jesus Christ, another spiritual physician among the Jews, he sees this abuse and he tightens that. He says, look, except for fornication, no divorce. He takes away the privilege. He takes away the privilege of divorcing because the people are playing fast and loose. If he's going to create any other, you know, they'll find other loopholes. So he takes away the privilege. So this is the evolution taking place. But now, we said, Jesus Christ didn't have the time or the opportunity to give you a remedy for all your sicknesses. So he said, I have yet many things to say, and there is somebody coming after me who will guide you into all truth. And we Muslims, we say that that spirit of truth is Muhammad, and has guided mankind that if it must, if you want to chapter in this book, there's a chapter, whole chapter is dedicated to divorce. How to go about? You don't have to go and wash your dirty linen in public. You know, as the Westerner does. He hires private detectives to spy on his wife, take some compromising pictures, and he takes them to court and he says, you see this woman, you don't have to do that. There is a system laid out in this book, how to divorce, if you must. But in Islam it's allowed, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad said, that one thing that is lawful in the sight of God, divorce, is the most hateful. It's lawful but most hateful. When a man divorces his wife, he says, the heavens and the earth, they shudder metaphorically they shake such a horrible thing but if it comes to part nicely there is a way part nicely give her some gifts and say darling you go find a better husband I'll find a better wife <laughs> so now uh, please go and enjoy yourself and before leaving each householder each householder please take one if there are two different families living in one house you can take two but otherwise one each, and if you run short, please contact us.